is not just that. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? Hmm? Hmm. And where you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings, though we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. Welcome, Gross Geese, to the Frugal Force. This is episode 10, and we're going to continue on tonight with, uh, you know, step-by-step step on setting up your grow all the way to harvest. Like last uh, last episode, we talked about the pregame and a lot of things that you need to, well, you don't need to, but it'll help you out if you thought about all this stuff and planned it out before you, you started growing. And we wanted to finish up with a couple things on that before we actually got into cloning tech and badge and all that and one of it one of them was is actual methods and like we we preach a lot of us on the show preach regenerative and all that and sometimes that's not necessarily the best for your environment or your situation people with autoimmune disease can't do that et cetera, et cetera, or you don't have access to a quality soil and you don't want to build soil so dwc or something like that would be a good route so what do you guys think about that you got any suggestions for the, the girlskies out there when they're picking say a style and a, a medium i think i think it's really key to to investigate for yourself the different options that are out there you know so I personally grew in many different styles and I think that's kind of how you settle on the way you want to grow and the way you grow is what fits your personality and the person you're, you know what I'm saying? It, it kind of, it's kind of part of who you are a little bit in a way too. So, you know, that's where like, you know, trying to knock on the way somebody else grows because it's different than you is it's silly because you're almost kind of knocking that personality a little bit too, you know, like it's just, we're all a community, we all get to grow. But to me, that's what really strives on it. So like early on, you might be really interested in hydroponics, you know, and then you start doing it and you start realizing it ain't as cool as you thought it was. And then you start realizing more and you go, man, organics are cool, I'm gonna try that. Or soil's cool, I'm gonna try that. And, uh, and that's kind of part of the experience of it, I think too, so. But that's my suggestion is research it. Just kind of look in a, a, a broad's eye view of the different styles. And one of them is going to kind of resonate with you uh, personality wise or wherever you're at. It's going to kind of be like, that's the way I want to do it. And it just kind of forms that. Way. It is kind of funny how like after a grower has been growing for a few years, you can almost judge their personality and how they are on their grow style and their grow room. And like how they just approach it. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. speaking on mediums, what's uh, what's everybody using themselves? I hand mixed my own soil, and that was after many years of research into it, and uh, many years of running um, nectar number four and some of the other mixes that were out there. Uh, Detroit Nutrient Company, Great Lakes Water Only was another one. Uh, Bigot Soil was another. But that was my personal choice, just based on, a lot of it was based on trying to find a soil that didn't have perlite. But, um, Is but that yeah. even possible without making it? <laughs> uh, Diggit didn't have perlite. That was one that I found. And I, and I, I'm honestly that they, that soil performed really well, and and uh, 
I really would have nothing. I can't say that my my recipe outperformed or didn't perform as well. It, it, they all seem to really perform similar, honestly. You know, but but I've come from growing in cocoa, and then I started out in that cocoa with uh, house and garden, and then transitioned to cocoa with uh, nectar for the gods. And then went into nectar soil with nectar for the gods. And then just the more I learned about how nectar did things, the more I realized I could do it myself. And it just was a natural progression that way. About you, M2, what uh, what are you running in? Or do you like what you're running in? You miss some of your mediums from the past? Or? Um, I've always grown in soil. And um, right now I'm in Potter's Gold premium potting soil, which is a Michigan company. Uh, before that, I used Fox Farm, and I've used cocoa and a couple different things, but I really like the potter's gold. Is that the stuff that comes in the black bag, and it's like super, super fluffy? Um, it's It comes in like a blue and a gold bag. Okay. I've seen it before around here, just that regular like hardware stores and stuff, potter's gold. I, I remember the label. It's like a gold, the label's gold, and then the bag is blue, right? Yeah, I remember that stuff. I want to say I used to use that for uh, my my clones and all that because that was like readily available at uh, like the local nursery. <laughs> I think it's cool. It's Michigan made too, so yeah, I didn't know that. I have to look back into that. I'm just, I actually use a little bit of everything. I uh, mostly, let's be honest, I mostly use soil. And it's usually M3 mix, which is what, Michigan, is it Michigan medical mix or something like that? Or Michigan marijuana mix, maybe they call it? M3 is what it says on the bag. Anyhow, it's uh, a peat based. And I've tried a lot of those ones that Smiley brought up. I tried. Uh, Detroit Nutrient Company, that was probably my second favorite. That's probably my second pick. I've tried uh, Dig It Soil. I feel that soil is a little heavy. I didn't like that. It, to me, it didn't seem like it. For a sip system where I'm wicking from the bottom, I felt like that stuff was always super he heavy and super overloaded with water, in my opinion. Yeah, it holds a lot of water for sure. Yeah. And then... Um, I like my plants to dry out, so I, I didn't like that about the biggest one. But I think Smiley kind of hit it the best with is like, try different things, man. Don't get stuck in one way and think that's the only way about growing. If you're starting to not like growing, change the, change the way you're growing. Try something new. Um, I've tried DWC and had mixed results with it. I thought it was pretty cool, I which was basically growing in water. And then... Um, I grow in cocoa. I used to, when I first started, I grew in cocoa for, I think, two years straight, just straight cocoa with synthetic nutrients, you know, and that's a whole different mindset and a whole different way of growing. So really, I think the best way of making that decision is just research the different styles and see which one you think would be the most fun, not which one would be the easiest, not which one would be this or that, what would be the most fun, because if you enjoy doing it, you'll do it. You don't enjoy doing it you're eventually going to find ways to get around doing that so i think find something that you enjoy doing yeah really look at your your personality when you're picking the style because if you want to just sit back and kind of watch your meds grow you don't want to have to deal with too many technical problems you're not the type of person that like to do numbers like a regenerative style with a lot of soil that's probably the way to go for you but if, you, if you're the type of person that likes to really get down to the nitty gritty, figure out what your plant likes at every stage of life, make sure it has perfect numbers, all that, like DWC is a blast for them, for those type of people. It, it's a, I would suggest everybody at least giving it a really good try, even if you don't want to try hard, at least once, because it's cool just to see the growth rate on that kind of race car system. That's it. I, I didn't... I didn't enjoy it. It interested me, but I didn't enjoy it. I set up a bucket and I tried some in veg and 
I couldn't control pH. And, you know, now I know more about it. I understand that the nutrients kind of help that you're running. The temperature swing, controlling the temperature of the water. But, yeah, it's all in how, how involved you want to be, you know. Yeah, that's kind of what the trade-off is, you know. Like, I think the analogy that I've always used about the hot rod, that's kind of a good analogy because as you move more towards fully hydroponic, you can get really great results, really fast growth, really increased um, yields even. But at the cost of you having to micromanage things. Whereas, you know, if you go the other route, you know, the route that most of us have taken, um, you go into soil and, you, and you're using natural practices or organics you tend to unlock more flavor you might sacrifice a little bit of yield but man i'm starting to have some pretty decent yields at least for home grow i mean it's not a commercial operation but for home grow i'm i'm, I'm not running out of weeds so that's perfect <laughs> if you ask I, me I, I like the hot rod analogy too because like you know, like a high-end, high-performance car, like some, you know, 1,000 horsepower Porsche or whatever, there's a certain amount of skill required to even drive a car like that. You know what I mean? If it's a manual, 10-speed, whatever, they're different than a normal manual. So you can say, yeah, I know how to drive a stick, but it's way fucking different if you got a double clutch or whatever. But, but the analogy fits because – if you're in a car that you can't necessarily drive or a system like that, that you're not exactly experienced enough to drive or run, you can run into a brick wall really freaking fast that way too. So, I mean, that's kind of the double-edged sword of it that I see there. Yeah, big disclaimer on the DWC. That's one of those <laughs> curl styles you can go in 12 hours later and all your hard work will be done because you fucked up. There's a pathogen or you let a pump go out or whatever. There's a lot of things that can just end it for you. There's like zero cushion room. You have to be on top of your game. You can um, do like what I always like to call like DWC with training wheels and do a hempy bucket. And uh, it kind of mixes the, <laughs> the, uh, the wicking from uh, kind of like our, a sip container or a wicking bed it mixes that with hydroponics because you don't have grow your grow medium is usually perlite or hydrogen and i don't know if you guys are familiar with hempy buckets but uh it's basically like a sip with hydroponic media like no soil no cocoa it's usually straight perlite and you and you're just filling it up with your nutrient water every day and to the bottom you know you pour it in through the top but it fills to the bottom so you, you have a little hole drilled you know so far from the bottom to so that you know that um, when you're filled enough water in, it'll start coming out that hole, and then you're done for the day. The roots will grow down into that, and, uh, you know, you don't need any power. You don't need any, you know, it's just like a, it's like a poor man's DWC. <laughs> I like it. I think, I think as far as mediums go, though, it is important to kind of look at, you know, what nutrient you're going to be feeding. So if you are running say like uh synthetic nutrient mix whatever line that you you know fancy is gonna work but you got to kind of balance that so like you're growing medium in that situation you want something that's not going to have a lot of food it's going to be pretty inert and, and blank where like certain uh potting soils uh you know potter's gold has some amendment to it uh you know, happy frog is one of the hottest soils I know of or whatever, but, but some of those are, are not necessarily designed to have that style run. So that's where, you know, it's kind of important to pick what you're thinking before you kind of decide on medium and all that too. So, so it's we weird that every decision's connected to everything else. You know, you know what I mean? You can, you can sit here, how long have we been talking? We can sit here and talk for hours and hours and hours and still, not lift one finger to build a grow, but we can sure talk about it for a long time. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not even to the actual, like, putting the plants in the ground yet. And it's been an episode and a quarter already. And, I mean, we're still not there because we, we need to cover another important thing is how you're actually going to feed these plants. Because you, if you're going to go out and spend $500 on a nutrient line, like, it 
and you're a beginner grower, it might actually be cheaper for you just to go to a provisioning center and get your meds than to grow it yourself. Like you can get down, you can fall for a lot of snake oil out there <laughs> and just start buying and buying and buying and you won't even realize it. And before you know it, you'll have a whole encyclopedia of stuff you thought you needed. And you're, you're That's a great point. Yeah. Grow stores can really see you coming. I mean, you'd be walking out of there with a whole complete lineup of 27 bottles and think you're a fucking mad scientist trying to mix stuff up for these plants and you could get by with three. Yeah, turning that whatever three ounces that you're going to get, probably you'll get lucky on your first grow on your plant into like, you know, you, you, to whatever $500 ounce of peas, basically, you know, you might as well just be going to get the damn top shelf. Because you'll, you'll use a, a lot of these lines, you'll use the whole bottle in a run. I mean, that should get expensive. Really, I think, honestly, for a first-time grower, the easiest is to get, you know, a known good soil mix. You know, I always recommend people to the Great Lakes Water Only. I know it's something available and it's easy for them to use. And they can get used to how the plant grows through its whole cycle and just water it, you know, and get used to how you water it. Cause like, you know, adding in trying to mix fertilizer and certain, you know, you got some lines have nine bottles, you know, so now you got all these different decisions to make on nine different things and how much to add and mix when really, you know, you don't even have down pat yet, like a good watering technique, for example, or, or how, you know, how moist should they be, let alone trying to mix that with a fertilizer and oversaturate it or undersaturate it. You know what I mean? It's like, well, try to keep yeah. it as simple as possible and then get more complicated as you get more experienced at it. That really would be the smart way to go. Start with like a soil organic grow where you're in a water only situation you're only putting water in maybe your ph in it but you, you know um a water only for a beginner and let them just concentrate on okay let me figure out this watering you know i need to let it dry out a little bit i can't just keep slamming it with water every single day and once they get the watering down then hey maybe let's throw a monkey wrench in this and let's throw some cocoa in next time and we'll try to start mixing nutrients and step it up again instead of trying to learn all of those things at the same time, it kind of takes one of those out of the equation when you go to soil. You know, soil is kind of like a buffer. It's a little bit more forgiving. And, um, you know, it's going to take over the responsibility of feeding the plant. And all you really got having to do is make sure those moisture levels are on point. Yeah. And I, anybody that's starting out and you're using the frugal force build, this is, you should do this on your first run. Like, some strains, yeah, they'll need a little bit of food. You might have to end up at the top dressing, but a lot of strains I've noticed you can do water only on your first run with that, and that'll be perfect for uh, a beginner grower because once you start adding stuff in, you can mess it up. It, I mean, yeah, that'd be way better. You see how the plant performs just with the base soil that you're doing and then add something in on the next run. And when you mean when you say something, I'm, I want to stress one thing, one something, yeah. and then you can compare. Okay, I added the one thing. What was the difference? How did it? You know, and, and keep doing that, adding the one things, and then then you can start adding products. You know, those bottles, we'll say, or whatever, or boxes, or whatever it's coming in. You can add that extra product and see if it really makes a difference. And then you can determine. Oh, I I got an extra gram this time. I'm not paying 10 bucks for this box of crap to give me an extra gram by the, at the end of it. Or it could be the completely opposite. You know, I got an extra two ounces per plant and you know, this product cost me way less than two ounces per plant. Yes. I'm going to continue to use that product. You know, those kind of things, you could never make that determination. If you added three things, what, what if one of those things was made all the difference and the other two aren't doing a damn thing. It's more fun to just add all the things at once there. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a soil grow grower to me. <laughs> you can do that in a soil grower. You're not driving a hot rod. <laughs> so that one thing, what, what would you all recommend that be? I would I'd probably say just a nice little, even all in one like BioLive or uh, Bad Bunny after the first run or even something like Recharge. It's supposed to 
know, get your soil going again. Yeah, those, all those are great. Great. I, I was my first. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be a fanboy here, but my first answer to your question when you asked it was recharge. I, I would use recharge because it has like it's one of those all-in-one things, but it doesn't have a lot of NPK. So especially for people who um, haven't used the product before or whatever, it's hard to overdo it. So, um, but I mean, the recommendation on the bag is like, I, th I use, I think half, I, th I use a half of a teaspoon per gallon. So it's 2.5 milliliters per gallon. It's very little, but I mean, it has molasses in it, which is going to be food for your microbes. It has kelp in it, which is going to be a micronutrient. Um, it's going to have some hormones in it. It's, I don't think it, I don't think there's any enzyme there. Um, it has amino acids in it, which are super important to, to building, you know, second metabolites. I've been actually adding just amino acids from NPK um, on top of when I add the recharge, I also add a dose of an extra dose of amino acids and I'm loving the terp. I, I think it's bringing the terps that, and, and I think a fish product is important. So that kelp being in, in recharge, I kind of, it's not quite fish, but I, I kind of count it if I can only, only down to one product. So, and then of course all the microbes. So it's got a bunch of beneficial bacteria and it's got, uh, I think at least one fungi in there. There might be more than one. Did you catch the one the other day? Uh, shout out to Michigan Matt. He was talking about uh, recharge and I, I might've been him and Scotty. I might've just been Scotty, but he was, they were talking about how uh, the humix and the fulvix in there and also the, uh, a few of the bacteria that they have in there, the bacillus, tillus, or something like that, can was uh, holding up cadmium and uh, lead, which was I thought was really really interesting. Like I need to, that's one way for me to handle my heavy metals is figuring out which one of these microbes is for each heavy metal and fucking just blasting the hell out of that. Well, the the good thing about recharge specifically, if you're worried about heavy metals is it has the humic acid in it which will also tie up some of those heavy metal it's actually was found they found a white paper in that same episode where the humic acid tied up all metals all so first thing it did or something <laughs> so humic acid is is big you should, everybody should be using humic acid if you're synthetic or organic i would be using a humic acid and uh, there's a billion of them out there Get you, you know, the, the real, the one I see a lot is BioEggs product. Uh, I think it's called Full Power. That's the one that's like, you see it industry-wide, but uh, New Millennium has Ruby Fulvic. That's a good one. Uh, I can't think of, I'm sure that there's so many Fulvic ads. You can make your own. Uh, Leighton Morrison was showing how you could go out to a forest near you and get some leaf material, you know, dig, get down and just grab, you know, this much leaf material put it in a, uh, a two liter that you cut the bottom off of and turn it upside down, put it in the two liter to hold your, your leaves, then pour water through that, unscrew the cap and let the water filter through. And what you get out of that, it's like gonna be like a brown liquidy uh, water, like a dirty water looking, but that's the, you just wash the fulvic acids out of that leaf material and into your water. So that's a way to get fulvic acid for pretty much free. The problem is, is you can't really know the levels of it to, to, you know, what you're doing, feeding your plant. So I wouldn't recommend watering that into a plant unless it was a soil system because soil is more forgiving. And um, I wouldn't really, when, when you're dealing with hydroponics, it's really, I feel almost essential to know what the hell you're putting in. You can't, so there's not really I, a lot of room guessing. I just want to say something quick on uh, humic and fulvic acid because what you're saying is right. In, uh, but it's basically humic acid includes fulvic acid. So it's kind of like a full spectrum RSO versus where the full power fulvic acid is like a more of a distillate because they're, it's the lighter portion of the humic acid. So they've removed a lot of the heavier portion. And there's that portion of how they humic acids are made. So there are some differences and there's a wide range of them out there, powder, liquid, whatever, but that gives some idea. Yeah, to, to my understanding, the difference between humic and fulvic acid is the size of the particles. 
so the fulvic is like you said more refined and and used more like a it, it's more efficient to use as a foliar application whereas humic you don't want to foliar that because the particles are so big the the plant's not going to likely uptake a lot of that through the leaves anyway so you, that's better to water into your soil but uh to finish my point i almost forgot um the bacillus subtilis was the specific bacteria strain that they said that was found to sequester, I believe it was iron, could be wrong, but, and then, uh, but it was to do one of the heavy metals. And then the other one that they mentioned was uh, the bacillus glomulin or something like that, or glomulus. And both of those are in recharge. I think that's probably why they looked it up. It's their product. So, but yeah, there was a cool episode with Matt on it. I just watched that uh, last night and I think I saw it. The thing was, was that, um, it's just one more tool in the toolbox. You know what I mean? Uh, in Michigan, when we have to have stuff tested, you know, one of the things is heavy metal testing. So if it's an issue, hey, there's there's a tool. All right. So I feel like you know we we're giving people something to think about. They know they they they've sourced their genetics. They figured out if they're gonna go and buy some seeds from a reputable dealer or they're gonna find somebody with a good clone stock and get some clones. We have some starter medium. We have a basic re-amending for them. So I say it's time to finally jump into how we, let's do seeds first. How's everybody like to pop seeds? Let's go around the, let's go around the panel. Um, I'll go, I guess, but I, I, I do a 24 hour soak so I get a little uh, jar, half jar, I guess, quarter jar. And I do 24 hours overnight in RO water. And then I take that same little amount of water and it works out in a two sheet paper towel. Basically I fold up, but the paper towel soaks up perfect that little half shot of water with the seeds. And then when they're in the paper towel and it's wet, I sprinkle them with great white which is uh, it's a bag, it's a microbial inoculum, inoculum. It's bacteria and fungi and probably it's the original and one of the original is probably one of the most wide variety in that. So that's kind of what I use there so that the taproot opens up into it. So they can look kind of na nasty the next day when you do it, but I fold that up and I put it in a, um, Ziploc baggie and I don't seal the baggie, but I do like uh, more like a 75% two thirds kind of zipped. So it's still got a little breathable. And then um, on top of my uh, T5 hood, I have a, uh, I don't know, it's a duct tape roll and I just set it on top of that. And it seems to keep them at the right temperature there. Uh, I used to do on top of my refrigerator too, but I, I do tend to try to find a fairly dark, warm spot to keep them because I think some of that temperature is uh, not too hot. You don't want to cook them, but I think they need some of that heat energy. And I think that's some of what kind of gives them spark of life energy, so to speak. So, but usually after a day in that paper towel, I got tap roots and I go right from there into my living soil about, you know, knuckle deep on my pinky and maybe a half inch, I guess, if I had to measure it out. But, you know, I just kind of do it that way, drop them in, tap root down, cover them up real lightly. And I, uh, um, I use uh, spray water, or, um, like a hairspray bottle, you know, just a pump sprayer, handle pump sprayer. And um, that's how I water them. But I have a saturated media in the pot that I put them in but then I you know the first week I just spray wash them water them that's it these little rock and roll if they don't I don't sweat it <laughs> for me I just um I started a lot like with Smiley's his process um and I would even went, I wouldn't went to the <clears throat> the extremes of boiling water and then pouring that boil, boiling, pouring that boiling water onto plates so they were warm and sterilized. And I had the paper towel on those plates, soaking it in the hot sterilized water. Cause it, and then putting the seeds on there and doing that whole, man, now all I do is put them in a root riot cube, just like I do a clone. 
and they pop just as easily and I don't stress. I even put them in the clone dome with the clones. I mean, when it, when it pops out of the top and I see one root come out of the cube, I'll use my inoculate on that one little root tip and plant that sucker. It's nice. I just like seeing the root tip. I'm just the, I, can't I don't like pulling them out of the paper towel. It drives me insane. It's that's like why the, I do there's microfiber day. hairs that you're ripping and uh, I don't like it, man. That's why I try to do it as fast as possible. I've seen guys let them get super long and that's their style. But yeah, every time they're super long, I worry about cracking them off. So that's the only thing I think about paper towel. Do it quick. And once you see them crack, go on the soil with them. Man, I love Root Riot. I, it's hard for, and I haven't found anything better. I mean, it was designed by NASA for God's sakes. I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to pretend to be uh, more smart than them. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, M2? How do you pop your seeds? Um, I'm really fancy. I put them directly in the soil. Um, thank you. Look, thank you, deep. And I spray them with a the water bottle until they pop. I plant all my autos that way. <laughs> I've, I've done other germination methods and I myself don't see a huge significant result doing them any of the different ways. So I choose the easiest, simplest method. I'm with you there. I have a somewhat of a spiritual way of doing, I guess. We, we either, I'll, I used to do it, but now I make Missy do it. But we'll take the seed and put it in your mouth because I believe that it helps it. And it also, the microbiome that I've been building between myself and my soil and my plants, I believe it just starts it out. It gives it the right inoculation. And we just put that on the top soil. And literally, I don't care about what direction it's put in or anything. I just put it in the center and I just kind of gently toss some dirt over it like, say, wind would in nature just barely cover it and just throw it in a, a wicking area. I just use a really big tray and I throw either my cups or my easy swaps in there and let them lick up and they'll pop in a few days. But I do Spartan, the, the root riot stuff. I just did that with the girl off for the first time. And I really liked the results of it. Like uh, you're basically, instead of doing the paper towels and waiting around for that period of time, like those couple of days, you're already like popped up and you have leaves if you're doing the root right tech and you're just throwing it right in like a day three. So it is and, pretty good. Yeah, and they're made out of compressed peat. So it's an organic option. It's not like it's not even inorganic or anything. They're, let me explain. I don't know how much time we got. Six minutes. Easily. I can do this. So why they're better than even soaking in straight water. I had this explained. I believe it was Vader OG explained it. No, because he soaks them in water. It wasn't Vader. Somebody was talking about it. For some reason, I thought it was Vader. But anyhow, when you, you know when you drop seed in a, in a shot glass of water, and it, it floats at the top for a little bit. And a lot of people will try to poke them down. Once they begin to open, you can poke them and they'll go to the bottom. Um, the water soaking into the shell of the seed is what kind of activates the, the seed to get started. You know, the gibberellic acid specifically is a hormone that gets it going. But you need water to get in there. When you have a seed floating on water, if you have a, around 50% of the seed not touching water, not surrounded by water. These root rat cubes are like spongy material. It's, it's a peat moss, but it feels almost like a sponge. And when you soak them in water, they hold water pretty well. And there's a hole drilled in the middle. And when you put that seed in there, it like, it, it's like almost pretty, it's fairly tight around the seed. So you have water touching or moisture touching around the seed 100%. And I think that's why you get a faster germination because you, you can, you're trying to infiltrate the seed from all directions instead of just the bottom half. It's definitely a performance way to do it. Like if you need to get those popped and things rolling in a couple of days, it's the way to do it. Because the method I just explained there, yeah, you'll get some, uh, some early bloomers, some ones that go really quick, but sometimes you're waiting, say an extra four or five days for it to pop up and get going. But, you never have dampening off issues though with that method, which is nice. Like the, the plants already inoculated for the environment, it's ready to go. One trick I heard from, I believe it was Kate, uh, 
shout out Ken and Kate. She hangs her baggies, like what you're saying, Smiley, you put them in the baggies. She actually hangs hers up and gravity makes the root go straight down so you don't get the tangled roots. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, just, just tack yours up a little bit and maybe uh, maybe your roots will just go straight down for you. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> Shout out to Kate. Can't wait till the, the cooking uh, show starts. It's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah. If you need a taste tester, you let me know, man. Fucking medicated mushroom jerky still blows my mind. <laughs> dude, like, what? Dude, this stuff's pretty good, man. <laughs> Crazy as shit. That's for sure, dude. I think I've gotten like two or three batches of that now. I like that stuff. Yeah. We're all going to get so fat watching her and Miss C just cook all kinds of stuff because they're not going to cook just, you know, uh, bakery and desserts or whatever they're gonna end up cooking you know a full meal i want to shout out miss c she has the fucking presentation down like that shit is like i don't even want to eat it i don't want to ruin this shit man it's fucking beautiful <laughs> <laughs> right needs needs a facebook post for it right <laughs> Yeah, it's the shit people fucking put on Facebook and Instagram and shit. <laughs> look at look at this. I'm about to eat this and destroy this art. That's <laughs> funny. No, shout out Miss C. That's some. She's always got some good, and it's always like matching whatever the holiday is or whatever. It's always good shit, man. Yeah, the patients absolutely love that. She puts in a lot of extra. That's that extra love that you get from caregivers. I used to do that every, I only did it for Christmas, but every Christmas I would just make all kinds of uh, Christmas holiday edibles, you know, like your peppermint bark or, uh, you know, and I would just experiment too, because I was just giving this stuff away. It wasn't like, oh no, if this sucks, they're going to be mad because it was free anyway. So, you know, I do the Rice Krispie treats and I, I would just slam them with all kinds of edibles for Christmas every year too, as a little like gift, a little gift, gift bag. So uh, I, miss, I miss that stuff, man. And on that note, we'll be right back. And we're back. We covered uh, seed tech there. It's time, now it's time to do my favorite. And I think it's one of the most important things in growing. And if you can't get it down, you probably should have somebody else grow your meds. And that's cloning. So, I mean, I guess I'll go ahead and knock mine out real quick because it's, it's really simple. Uh, if I can't use a aeroponic cloner, you know, I preach regenerative and all this stuff all day. I love aeroponic cloners. Uh, is you can take a humongous clone for one, throw it in there, come back in a week and you got roots. Uh, majority of the time, I can't do that because just just temperature or whatever, because you have to keep it cold, the, the rest cold when you're doing that. So nowadays, I've just been using, uh, either going right in the soil, or I'll use a root rye cube and aloe vera. Just uh, expose a node. Uh, most of the time, I won't shave unless it's a got any kind of purpling or hardening to the, the stem that's the only time I'll do a shave on it but I, I always just make sure the nodes are exposed because that seems to be where the majority of the roots come out from my experience and just a simple dip in the aloe vera sleeve and then in the uh, root rye throw it in the dome and the only reason I would ever tell you to clip leaves before you throw it in there is if you're taking a bunch of clones and you're worried about airflow. Otherwise, just expose the node, dip it in some aloe, put it in the dome. And I like to actually keep mine at 100% humidity for a week straight. And then I will crack one side of the, the, little, the rotator things on the domes. I'll crack one side of that and let it sit there for a day. And then I take the dome completely off. It's, it works out. I've never had, I don't, I don't really have that many clones just die off or anything like that from that. What, uh, what humidity are you running your <coughs> area that they're, so when you take that dome off, like what temp and humidity are they being exposed to though? Everything is, runs at 60% humidity right now. Okay. 
Yeah. So that, I, I only made that, raised that question because, you know, for somebody listening, if you're thinking of doing that, there's a big difference between having 60% humidity in your veg versus 35% humidity in your veg. So it's something that you should be aware of if you're a listener out there going to do that. So. It is Sometimes we say what we do, but we don't give the parameters of why we can do what we do. You know what I mean? That, that's the great thing about having a panel here. We cover all ends. That's true. I mean, you really could mess up right there if you didn't have the right kind of humidity in your ambient. If you just took it off like I did right there, you had 35% humidity. If you dropped from whatever, because it's with that one open, I'd say it's probably still sitting at 80. If you just rip that out there at 35, those things are going to like, And another thing, too, is the leaf, when we're cutting the leaves, yes, they'll root in my in my experience yes they'll root faster if you do not cut those leaves but if you don't cut those leaves and they're a good size leaf especially when you do that when you expose them to a lower humidity it's way more stressful on them so i've gone back to cutting the leaves i cut them every time now because um it's just i don't have to harden off ever like I'll, st I'll keep the clone dome on there, like what you're saying, with 100% humidity for like maybe the first two days tops, and then I start opening those. I start opening those things early, and then um, I will. I, I love doing dunks at the clone stage. So every day, instead of like watering your plants, I dunk my clones. I'll dunk them into whatever I'm I'm watering into my uh, veg at the, that time. Those clones get dunked in it. So it might have like a light charge of a microbe or something in it. And, uh, but they get those every day. So they're, that's my, my misting, I guess. And that's all I do. And then when they get a lot of roots on them, I take them out of there and I stick them in a, in some soil. So, but I do the same process that you said, as far as when I take my clones, um, the only difference as far as me is I usually, where I take my clone is at the top of the plant. I'm usually, top in my plant at that point. So I'm, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. I'm top in my plant and I'm using that apical meristem, the most fastest growing part of the plant. I'm using that for my clone. So I think it's a win-win. And, and so like before my plants go into flower, maybe a couple of weeks before they go into flower, I want to make sure that canopy is nice and flat. I'll do some topping right then and then uh, take those tops and clone them. So since we're, we're frugal forests, I, I want to say, like, I don't know if you got, if y'all agree or not, but would you say a rooting hormone like Clonex or even aloe vera, you, they help, but you don't necessarily need them. Like if, say you have a few weeks or whatever, you're not rushed to get some clones in, would you all say that you don't really need to uh, worry about spending the money on a rooting hormone? I think I paid ten dollars for this five years ago, and I'm still using it. It's just a powder. I think it's good just to be able to seal off where you made those cuts on the clone. I like. To Lost your audio there, Smart. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm saying I do that because I, I like using it every time because it's sealing off all those cuts. Um, I do do the, the shaving, like you said. I don't know if I'm repeating myself or if I, I'm not, but um, shave them off, put it in that powder. It's a powder. And I got it like five, like I, I'm not kidding, five years ago. And that little bottle cost like 10 bucks on clearance at a, I think it was a Home Depot. And um, I had very good, have, I've had great luck with cloning, just using the root right cubes, like what we were saying, and that powder. I don't think I've ever even been exposed to a powder for the rooting hormone. It's always been a gel form. Like that wasn't even in my brain. Like that, that would be very cheap. Like at that point, yeah, I would use a damn rooting hormone every time. Same thing if you can grow an aloe vera plant. Like I have nonstop rooting hormone. Or if you have a willow tree on your property that you can make willow water with, that's another, it's IAA. That's what's in all these rooting hormones. It's, it's in willow. So you can, you can actually make your own if, if you have access to young willow. 
branches that you can cut up in discs and soak them in water and there you go there's your willow water and i would say to answer your question though about you no know, you can grow roots they will pop and just sitting in a cup of water i i think on my instagram i might have i don't know it might have been on my story so it's not there but yeah i mean i forgot about some just in a cup of water and they pop roots but it's the time that it involves to get those roots so like when you're on a, uh, a schedule looking at a rooting hormone is going to bump you, you know, five days sooner, you're going to have some of those roots. So the plant does have those root hormones, but adding an abundance of it's going to move it along faster for you. So. I would always say to take your clones when the plant is ready to be topped. If you do it like what I do when you take your tops and not to try to hold off to try to make the timing right take it when it's right to take the top and then um, shout out to loki grow i just learned this little trick if you wanted to say you had to take that top earlier than what you really wanted to you can take that cutting and put it in the refrigerator in a, in a thing of water if you want to and it'll really slow it down it, huh. it, and you can keep it for like two, he said you could take cuttings just wrapped in the wet paper towels for like a week or two in the refrigerator huh but you can really, really slow them down that way. Um, there's like little tricks you can do. That's crazy. I never heard that before. Cool. Yeah. I love stuff. With, with the waters, uh, we do. We even use that at work. That's a trick to slow it down. Well, we got to take the cuttings. We want to get rid of that mother plant, but we don't want to put them in the root rise yet. We just stick them in cups of water. Uh, Balish saw that on the tour. And the thing is, is you just got to make sure you replace that water, or at least top it off. But the reason for that, we, the reason for replacing it is, is the dissolved oxygen in that water. You know, it's going to eventually go away and you want to replace that oxygen in the water. You don't want to get anaerobic conditions if you just leave it sit there. And plus the plant will uptake some of that water too. So it's going to come down and it'll evaporate. So it's not just as easy as set it and forget it, but it is pretty damn easy. Just change the water every day. It's a pretty nice thing to know too. If uh, you run out of time or whatever, because I've, I've uh, set clones in water and then came back the next day and then did my cloning or whatever. And I've actually tried there for a while doing uh, 24 hour soaks with all the water. But I can't say that it was any kind of boost or not. I, it was just a method I was following there for a minute because it made it, it was even, it was easier on me. To, I'd even had, I was getting so lazy. I didn't even want to like dunk it in the sleeves. I just wanted to, let it soak it up in the water and then call it a day and throw it in the cube. I was getting bad there. I cannot believe how minimal and lazy I was. I was trying to grow. Well, the, the, when you dunk them in the aloe sleeve, I know you said you don't really shave them that often unless you have like purpling or something. But if you dunk them in that, in that sleeve, you're actually making micro tears in that. So you're actually doing that process all in one when you, when you do that aloe, the aloe dunk. But that does help root growth. But you're right too about the nodes. When you take a clone, I'm gonna cough here because I just took a hit, but when you take a clone, take it right below a node where there's another branch coming out. Like, so if this is, let me see on this camera. Okay, so here's your main branch going straight up. Here's a side branch coming off. Take the cut right below that side branch. Cut that little, this a little side shoot off and cut it right below that. And that little node in that knuckle right there, that's where your roots are gonna form probably the fastest. So um, that's why you want to take it right by where there's a branch or a little side shoot right there because um, that's going to give you better, better rooting. If you take it somewhere in the middle of the nodes and, you, and, and there's not a node down in that root right cube, I find that they, they take longer to root. Agreed. So now that we got the, the cloning and the seeds down, Let's, let's say, theoretically, our stuff popped, our, our clones made it through the hell week, and we're ready to, to go and start our veg. What's, uh, what's some precautions or things people should uh, keep in mind before they, they go in there and start doing it? Stuff like, say, light intensity is a, a big one, because we're all running nice fancy LEDs now. Most of the time, we're cloning under cheap CFL or T5s, and it's that can be a somewhat stressful transfer on plants. So I definitely recommend 
uh, whatever light you're using which, when you're going straight in to back it off, back it hell on for a minute and see how they respond. I, um, instead of turning the intensity down and lowering the light, which is a hell of a lot smarter idea because it's going to save you way more money. I'm the lazy guy when it comes to this. I want to do what's fucking easy. And I'm going to, I have my light pegged at the ceiling of my bedroom. So when I have smaller plants, they're way far away from the light and they're getting that lower intensity. But it also allows me to have different stages of growth in the same veg space. So I can have the taller plants and I can have the shorter plants and I kind of put them in order that way. So the light does, so the tall plants aren't shadowing the, the shorter plants. But uh, other than that, I just keep that light all the way up to the top. And so the plants can grow into it. They can grow into the intensity they want kind of a deal. Yeah, and then any kind of problems, I'd say, like especially if you're running, a, you got a decent uh, organic soil or build or whatever, any kind of problems you run into, you need to think about, did you overwater? Or like we were just saying with the light intensity, I seem, I seem to find that that, is, that causes the majority of problems uh, in veg for anybody because I mean even even on your second third run or whatever you're just reamending like the majority of the time deficiencies I find especially in the frugal builds is either from over water or too much light it it, it couldn't you know perform it was fucking getting blasted the thing that I've done and maybe this is why I don't really see a lot too i forgot to mention my cloning space is in my bedroom so it's getting side light of the same veg light that it will be going into we'll say it doesn't really leave the room it's in the same room it's just all i did is put a shelf in my bedroom and then put my clones on it i have a little led light above it for like a supplemental but it's a really low wattage like 10 or 15 watts they don't get much from that the majority of their light that the these clones are getting are from that that veg light that they'll be vegging under too so I, I guess the insight I would have for people going into veg is to look at your humidity. Um, I think a lot of the problems I see people have in veg is, is from low humidity. It's too dry for the babies in there. So, um, and that's not to say you have to have high humidity all the way through, but I just think it's something that in, in a vegetative area, if you can get it up above 50 at least is going to be, a minimum so um we were at 60 abolished and that's in my opinion about perfect and uh that was one thing i think to learn is that effect of humidity on and temp on the plant but other than that as far as light goes i've i've kind of developed the uh the line of thought that the light is the the light is the workload of the plant so to speak so like if it's um, if it's a little little plant, you're not going to want to put a heavy workload on it <laughs> until it's a bigger plant. But in that kind of a analogy on it, you're going to look at the size of the plant and and ramp up that wattage or that power of light for that size of plant. So it's not always feasible for people. Um, that's how I kind of try to set it up as far as on a production line, but uh, at my personal home, there's, uh, I go with, there's four plants that are gonna be under one three fifteen, And those plants are going under, you know, two one thousands is what they get dialed up to. But you don't wanna just jump in under those thousands too, you know what I mean? So you, that's kind of the other thing to keep in mind is what, what wattage or what power of light is that plant under in veg and what is it gonna go into under flowers. So if you are in that situation, like I have to have ballast, I can dial way back to 600 so that that plant can have a chance to even adjust to that before I crank it up to a thousand, um, so to speak. But it's all kind of, that's how I look at light is how in relation to the size of the plant. So. Another big thing I noticed, like I, I said a minute ago with the overwatering, but when you're first putting your clones in, do not fully saturate everything. 
just water around the immediate area of the plant. You want the roots to grow out and search for the moisture. If you just if it's not a health if the it's not a healthy clone, the roots aren't rocking, they got root bound a little bit or something like that, and then you go in there and you just oversaturate them, they're not gonna perform as well. You want them roots to seek out. The faster you root out that pot, the faster you're gonna be rocking and flowering. Yeah, and I don't, I think that the, um, for me, I don't really take veg as serious as I guess I should have. I mean, I should, I should, not should, I don't know. Veg is really important, guys. <laughs> you don't want to go into flower with a subpar plant. In my opinion, you want to have the best of the best of the best is the only, the only ones that are allowed in the flower room. Um, so that's my strategy. I might have gone, gone over this before in a, in a previous episode, but long story short i veg more plants than i'll ever flower they don't not all the plants that i veg make it into flower but i always have a few in there and the reason i have a few in there is because you always inevitably have a one that grows subpar in my opinion or like it's not the perfect one and if you have two to choose from of course you, you're going to want to have that choice and take advantage of it and take the better plant so if you have the ability to do that, I would say, you know, grow as many, veg as many plants as, as you can so that you can really set yourself up for success in the flower room by picking the best of the best. I think it's a really good strategy. Yeah, learn how to spark and kick early. Don't get attached to weak plants. Well, that's another good lesson for especially people that are early on. It's really hard to kill plants. It's super hard to kill plants for people. So if, babies, if, you're brutal, man. So if you if you clone if you clone a million of them, you get used to killing plants, no problem. I yeah, I guess. It's still, I get sad, man. It's like a piece of me. It's but it's the same plant. So you didn't kill the plant. I've got the same plant for <laughs> four or five years now. You would kill a male you know, every time, time it snips. I'm just, like, oh. I'm just cutting off her fingernails and keeping her pretty, man. She's still here. She's still impressing me every bowl. It, it was great. Uh, I did, yeah, it, well, I wouldn't say it was the first time. It was quite a few harvests in. Uh, I went in and I harvested the whole room, and then I came back out, and Miss C was crying. And I was like, what are, why are you crying? She's like, it's because you went in there in the dark, and you just killed them. <laughs> you killed them in their sleep. And she was bawling. It, it was great. That's awesome, man. It's your baby. What are you doing? <laughs> that's cool that's that love man and that's the hidden yeah. component. that's what makes every fucking great gardener great is that they give a shit you know what i mean everybody kids about oh what's you know i give it that's the love you're tasting it is 100 percent. it's them giving a shit it's them wanting to go in and do this every single day you know it's taking a piece of your life to do this and it's a piece of you as a representation of you people that take it that serious that's the shit i want to smoke for real Look at, look at her girl right now. The Mystic Man is fucking killing it. She still needs pink crystals. <laughs> What's the pink for? Is that gives you more phosphorus or something? <laughs> it's a love crystal. I don't know. It's we did have a she did have a fairy garden started up in like three pots, uh, I'd say like a year ago, but somehow the the regenerative pots have ate those fairies. They're somewhere and they're getting broke down. So we haven't seen them in a while. There's one dude in the groth that's got a, his uh, bulldog that he's posted in all the pictures. It's freaking awesome, I think. It's a, like a garden gnome, man. That's fucking protecting his plants. It's cool shit. Gotta do it. I love the shit out of my dogs, but they have never set foot in my grow rooms. I don't know if I can do that, man. No, it's a it's a statue. It's like a oh, okay. Are you saying they're actual dogs? Dog. Dog. Yeah, he's, so like all the pictures, it's like I don't know the dogs looking at him and shit like that. It's cool, it's like a garden gnome but different. Yeah, yeah. we we should have covered that, you know, before anything. That's one of the most important things is you got to establish if you're going to have gnomes or you're going to have a fairy garden. You know, you got to have that protection in the garden and that luck. My granddaughter gave me a gnome. It's in my. It's right next to my clone dome, actually. He's he's guarding the most important part, man. He's keeping the babies. 
keep them safe. I think that is an important part, though. Like, there's certain purposes to it. Like, I don't know, like, just doing shit like that because it don't make sense. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. People are like, well, crystals, there's no scientific proof. Well, so what? It's something fun to fucking I would argue. Do. I, I, I could argue differently. Marbles in there, good. too. Whatever, dude. Like, <laughs> I could argue different because I'm saying anything that you, it's the placebo effect. If nothing else, it's the placebo effect. And how can you argue against this? If the gardener thinks it makes a difference, the psyche or whatever it is that's affecting the change of the world, you know, it happens. It's the placebo effect, you know? So if, if you think playing heavy metal, even though it's been proven scientifically not to, if you think playing heavy metal makes your plants fucking better, that might happen because now you're going to enjoy being in there with the plants. You're going to spend time in there longer. You're going to enjoy yourself while you're in there and you're going to be a better gardener because of it. So I say, whatever you feel is going to, you know, outside of crazy things like setting your plants on fire, but you know, things that are, you can't argue are detrimental to your plant. Do it, man. If, if you feel it's going to make your garden better, do it because all I can do is make it better. Kenny G in the garden is proof of course approved. I like Kenny G, man. <laughs> saxophone. That's what I played. <laughs> saxophone. That's the kind of mood I want you to have when you uh, adjust my cannabis. It's like you listen to some Kenny G. <laughs> Kamala, the Cooper elevator music. <laughs> it's very relaxing, man. It's great to go to sleep to. Like that man is amazing. How long he can hold a note on one breath. Dude. I like what M2 posted. You got to hug them. You got to hug them before they go. All right. So we got we got our clones in. We got ways. We got our seedlings going. Now it's time to. You really need to start thinking about training early on. Uh, whether you're either going to let the plants just grow naturally and have a bunch of them in there to fill your space, that's a pretty good way to do it because it, that it seems it's a lot quicker too. You're not slowing the plant down with the top. Or if you're in, say, like a smaller tent, like a four by two or a four by four, it's really a good idea to throw stuff into a net, I feel, and pack it in there. You get every little square covered. You get you get a really good yield, even out of those smaller tents when you do that. Rather than just running, you know, no no training at all or just wild training. Wait a minute, you gotta define wild training. What, what, okay. <laughs> Wild training is the guy that goes into their grow room or girl, we got to keep it equal here, and tries this new method that they've seen their favorite grower do every other week on every other plant. So I'm not a fan of trellising in veg only because I don't have, or only because I do have a flower room. So I'm going to have to move those plants. So if I trellis them in veg, that's going to be a gigantic pain in my ass to get them out of the trellis, to get them into another trellis in the flower room. So my trellis happens in the flower room. I don't do that in veg for that reason. Um, as far as other training, what I'm trying to do mostly, my biggest mission is I'm trying to make a tabletop flat canopy. That's what I'm doing. So that might be super cropping. That might be low stress training where I'm using my plant yo-yos to hook on the edge of the pot and then stretch and pull my branch down to where I want it. And then I can set it with a yo-yo tension. I love them for that. And, um, or like I was talking about with topping, you know, I'll take the top and take a clone at the same time, but that's shaping the plant too. I'm taking the tallest branch. <clears throat> when I take that top off, it's flattening out my canopy too. So my biggest plant training is all, I'm uh, just trying to make a flat square. I want to fill a four by four space and I want it to be like a tabletop if I can. That would be my perfect canopy. And then um, I also, when they, before they leave veg, they're going to get um, one to two lollipoppings where I'm just taking some of that bottom growth off. I don't like anything really close to the ground to, you know, provide a highway, a, a, a shortcut to bugs. And then um, also anything that's in the shade, why keep it? Take that out. It's just going to get, it's just going to divert 
in my eyes, resources to the wrong areas. Just take that out so it won't go there and everything goes up. The, I made a, a comment on the last episode, I think, about um, my opinion on solo cups, but that comes from a reason for this, like training-wise. So as that plant's root hits the bottom of that solo cup and or plastic container starts to wrap, I've personally experienced, this is just my own experience and no scientific, but that plant will tend to try to grow more straight up and less branching. And my reason for recommending a, a breathable pot or one that air prunes of some type is because when you can get that, that same kind of bushing in your root ball, I think it allows the plant structure above to have a better branching available to it. So, and, and that's the idea that I work off from. And I, I get after them pretty early. Um, I, I like to have a few node sets on there. I don't like to take all the leaves, but I train by taking those top growth leaves off and it encourages an even branching. Um, so I, I don't know, that's just the way it always turns into a bushy ball like that. And you're always taking the top leaves yeah. and stretching. And you're talking about like the GML, they call it the GML topping technique, yeah, where they take, take, well, I guess what would be the fan leaves when they grew out and taking them out. So you're leaving the actual tips. Yep. I did it on so an Instagram on the grow off post. I did it. Um, it's kind of hard to see in the pictures, but that's kind of what I did is I just took two leaves off the top there. You know, I've seen some of the other guys were topping them the traditional way and, and I've done that too. It works great, but I just, I did it on that grow off just to kind of show there's different methods you can go about doing it, you know? Yeah, I actually use that technique on my Mac because it's so tedious to do it on the other ones because they top out so much. But the Mac grows so fucking slow, it's not a big deal. And it works great. <laughs> and that's the other thing. It, it is, it's a it's a daily or every other day kind of process. So um, you really have to stay after them, especially the bigger the plant gets, the harder it is to keep after them. But I found it was the same when they, even you try to top them and cut a plant that way, it's basically the same too because – you know, I don't know, I just try to shape that structure. It seemed like you were cutting tops all the time too, so. So. I was really regretting not starting in an easy spot with my uh, my grow-offs, because everybody that did, theirs are looking a lot better. Mine, like you were saying, they're just, they're straight pole. Like, they're really tall plants, but it's just a straight pole. And I've That's seen that. the structure I'm looking for right now. I'd rather have a bush. Yeah, I've seen information about how, like, the pot size and shape will determine how the plant grows. Like if you have a narrow, tall pot, your plants are gonna grow tall and narrow. But if you're, because your roots going really far down and deep, so it's saying, oh, I can get a hold, I can hold onto this plant. But if you had a really narrow, not a very deep, a shallow, if you had a really shallow, like my, my soup containers are fa fairly shallow, but they're really like long. So instead my plants will, because the roots can't go dead down deep, and they have to spread out wide, the plant kind of does the same thing, kind of spreads out wide, and you get more of a bushy kind of a structure. So if you can get a squatter pot, if you're looking for squatter plants, that might be one way to manipulate that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the amazing swap pots are so freaking cool in the wicking because they're not, they're pruning a little bit, but the ones towards the bottom at the water, they're not, they're extending out, like these, these roots are covering my entire dish, and I'm loving that. It's cool that's making for a hell of a, a transplant or whatever you know i get a much better plan you're just going pot right into the soil or right under the soil or you did that, that's my new plan now i have uh i think 14 of the the solo swaps set up now so that should be enough to keep me going i don't know i, I probably should get around 20 and then i'll never run out in the rotation i don't think but yeah that that's my plan I hate that I had to use cups on those. It's just because all my swaps were full. So I like the idea of a number one. So like those little half ones we got. To me, I mean, I like I like the pot. It's just to me, it's a little small for what. If you're gonna, you'd have to you're gonna have to transplant quicker in those. I think you know. So I like having a number one because my next transplant is gonna be into the big number ten that it's gonna grow its life in. So. It's just my style for that. But. Yeah, I've got 10 of their number one, so I like that size too. 
is you can get a decent sized plant and veg in a number one, you know, even running at root bound, but they, but that root pruning gives you the ability to run a little bigger plant just so you out of water more often. So. Yeah, I'm looking at right now probably a it's a blue cough and it looks like it's about a foot and a half tall and it's probably about two feet wide in, in one of those pots right now, a one gallon easy swap pot. And I've seen people have crazy ones in solo cups too, so I'm not trying to, it's just for me personally that that's the way it's worked out. It's be a lot better plant structure, a lot better root ball at the transplant. It's less shock it seems like. So So what do you guys what do you guys think? We uh Anything else for the the veg stage that we missed that people uh, should look into? I mean, we I would just that. like the only thing we didn't touch on is this. This is a good time to get that IPM going. You know, whatever yeah. you're going to be, start doing that in veg. That which which yeah. refer back to episode three where we did pests. Like we covered IPM really well there. Pretty much all the most common things that you're going to deal with. We, so one of us has dealt with it and beat it. There's a method in there for you. But uh, let's, do, uh, let's do some shout outs and closing statements because I don't want us to get too far into the next subject because uh, pre flower and all that and prepping your soil, all that good stuff, that's all up. So, that, so. so let's go around the panel. Smiley. Um, Smiley's Garden on underscore Garden on Instagram, but um, a shout out would be, I guess, to all the medical professional people that are, uh, you know, like, I don't know, I was talking today, it just doesn't hit home, because I don't know anybody that's got sick from it, but, you know, like, these medical professional people are putting their self in line, and that's pretty badass, so shout out to all them guys. Yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to say this earlier. Shout out to definitely the medical professionals and any of you that are here in Michigan. I would definitely like reach out to me if you cannot afford seeds. I would love to hook you up with your legal limit as well. Just get in touch with me. My DMs always open. I'll, I'd love to get back to you for what you're doing. Spartan Grow. I just want to. Obviously, I, I can't say the same thing, so I'm gonna uh, I want to shout out to the Groskies all over the world, you know. But specifically here in Michigan, watch it, man. It's getting rough out here, so shout out to them. And two, Michigan medicated. Um, thanks for having me on. Shout out to all of you guys. And as always, I'd like to shout out. Uh, our whole community here in the Michigan Bros Girls Show. Definitely everybody out there uh, being smart, staying quarantined, and all our medical professionals. Uh, also like to shout out to my sponsors, Easy Swap Pods, Mantis Genetics, and Bad Bunny Nutrients. Use code abolish with most of those for a 10% discount. And on that note, may the approval force be with you. Oh, I hate goodbyes. <laughs> uh, Lloyd. Shh. Just go. Damn button. Push the goddamn button. You heard what she said.